Doc Reed. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. So it's yeah, uh, okay. You got it. It is setting up the webinar for Facebook Live. And as soon as I get confirmation, I will come back to Zoom and hit the record button. And we are rocking and rolling. Good. Okay. Okay. There it is, it says we're live now. Perfect, and so I go back to here, and here I hit the record button. Wow. And welcome, welcome everybody to Day Drinking with Wes Hagen. How exciting uh, today to have one of my favorite local winemakers and a guy who's probably taught me, even though I was his vineyard manager, he basically has taught me probably more about canopy management and exactly how to make uh, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay perfectly uh, managed for flavor uh, at uh, my previous job at Club Pepe, Mr. Ken Brown. Welcome, Ken. Wes, well, a pleasure. Absolutely, let's get right into it. Um, I might've told you before that the 1989 Santa Barbara County uh, version of the uh, Byron Pinot Noir was actually the first wine uh, that I drank in my late teens, early 20s that actually stopped me in my tracks and made me realize that wine could be special. Um, it was, I'm, I'm sure you've heard a lot of stories from lots of folks uh, that, you know, really define the quality of Santa Barbara County uh, through the uh, lens of, of your work and what you've done both, uh, both at Byron, or Zach Mesa of Byron, as well as uh, Ken Brown Wine. So the first question I have for you is really just uh, an open invitation to tell us about sort of your journey in wine uh, growing up, a little bit about your schooling, a little bit kind yeah. of about, uh, about Oregon, about maybe even Sacramento, Oregon, and then of course uh, your, uh, your, your, uh, uh, your trips uh, into, of course, uh, Santa Barbara wine. How did you end up in Santa Barbara? I just love to hear the story. Good, all right. Um, this won't be the condensed version. <laughs> How many, what do you have, three hours? <laughs> I got it. No problem. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go back before I really fell in love with wines. I, I uh, started off my educational career um, in business administration and kind of a specialty in finance. And I always thought it was kind of boring and that, you know, and I go, oh, what am I doing this for? But I tell you, fast forward to now uh, running a winery business, I'm so happy that I have that business background, understand a little bit about financing and a little bit about, you know, tax stuff, at least going back that far. So uh, anyway, that's kind of where it all started. And um, this was, I was living in uh, Sacramento. I was born and raised there, but uh, my dad was a real estate developer. We moved all around California and over to Hawaii and so forth from various projects that he was doing. But anyway, so in, um, in Sacramento, um, when I was, um, I started uh, after I graduated, my first real job was with IBM. And it was just this, incredible job. I've been lucky throughout my career. I kind of have to pinch myself. I look at each one of the phases I've gone through. But um, I was in uh, sales at, in the Sacramento office of IBM. And it was just, there were three companies when I graduated. I said, these are the three companies that I want to consider working for. First one I went to was IBM and they hired me. So I feel mm. pretty fortunate. And I happened to be there just at the, I call it the rock and roll the days when uh, IBM share was, you know, sp splitting two or three times a year. For every share we earned or, or bought, uh, IBM matched that. Whoa. So during those those years that I was with IBM, it was about four or five years, um, I ended up, and this isn't bragging, it's just like you know, being at the right place at the right time. I ended up buying my first house in California free and clear just with some of the IBM stock. So wow. a real nice way to start off. Yeah. But, uh, you know, then once you get into the wine business, anything you accumulated prior to that, you lose it anyway. So it doesn't make too much difference. Okay. So then from IBM, my, my father, as I said, was a real estate developer. And uh, he wanted me to work with him, with him. And I thought, you know, that'd be a good opportunity. I, I loved IBM. Um, incredible company. Um, the ethics were super. You never spoke badly about the competition. You knew everything about the products and you sold your strong points without saying this is, a, this is the competition's weak points. So it was really, really good training. But anyway, um, kind of got burned out on kind of talking about the same products and so forth. 
as a salesperson. And uh, kind of it lined up and I thought, oh, I'm gonna work for my dad, that'd be, that'd be good. That only lasted about three years. I just, I, that's when I was, I should back up when I was at IBM, is when I started getting involved in a couple of wine tasting groups. Mm-hmm. One of them were just you know casual friends and the other was a semi-professional with uh, some uh, like professors from Davis and wholesalers and retailers and that type of thing. So that was a, that was a really good opportunity. Um, so anyway, then um, what I decided was I knew that I wanted at that point, I spent enough years with my father, which was good, but it still didn't, I wasn't passionate about it. I'm going to find something I was really passionate about. And you know, I'd been involved in these tasting groups and visited quite a few wineries, and I was really loving that. So I decided, okay, I'm going to take the leap. And it wasn't it really, I think back on it, it wasn't, I just knew that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't care what happened. Uh, my friends at that time just looked at me and go, what are you doing? You're crazy leaving this behind. You're going to go do what? You're going to go back to school? You're, you know, you're nuts. Well, I still know a couple of those people. And they look at me now. You're the luckiest guy in the world. You found something you love to do. And yeah, you know, so be it. I just happened to follow my passion and have always done so. I'm kind of really happy about that. Okay. Uh, so um, then um, after about, I'm going to say eight years in the real world of working for IBM and real estate development, um, I decide it's time. I've got a choice here to work with, you know, Warren Winiarski, a you know, winemaker, and learn whatever their you know, secrets are, um, get into the vineyard side, get in the retail side, get in the whole side. I just wanted to, that whole, you know, all look at all options. And I'm an outside person. I love, I love plants and working with plants. So I thought, well, and I love, I love drinking wine. I thought, what I should do, I don't have much of a background at all in chemistry and microbiology and that stuff, which I thought it'd be important to have because um, by going to Fresno State, I knew I could get that. And Fresno State had an excellent enology pro, uh, both viticulture and enology. So I was one of the first students that went there that took as a graduate student actually, took both the viticulture program and the enology program. And I still think back to it, it was really strange that in that era, you were either a vineyard person or you were an enologist, you weren't both. But my background being started from wine and my father, you know, wasn't obviously in the wine business or the vineyard business. Um, I, I just felt that it's, an, it's kind of, the, the whole process you know, starts the day you figure out the land you're going to buy to plant the vineyard, you plant the vineyard, grow the grapes, and you know, ultimately you make the wine and to understand the processes and all that. So it's the big picture. And that it really worked out well for me to go to Fresno State. And when I was there, I ended up as I went as a grad, graduate student, even though I was taking all the undergraduate uh, vet, enology, chemistry, and micro classes, but then I felt that I was really well prepared uh, to really understand kind of at least at that point, the overall wine world. And then um, I was started heading up the uh, uh, research program, both in the vineyard and in the winery, which was a great opportunity to, have to be pretty close friends with uh, especially the enology professor and also the vit professor. And um, the first biggest time- Or Fred Nury? But yeah, Dr. Nuri. Dr. Fred Nuri, who taught me, who was on my first panel when I judged wine for the first time. He, he was yeah. so gentle. Well, he was the head of the food science department. Yeah, but um, Sigmund Chandrel, uh, obviously a German, was was um, the person that was heading up the enology program. Really a very good winemaker, but he was more great on white wines. So I, we're talking, before we went live, we were talking about Riesling. I knew more about making Riesling than probably anybody in California when I left Fresno State. Um, so anyway, then um, having that opportunity, the, one of the first assignments, assignments I got on the Enology uh, internship was working with the first, some of the first vineyards in Santa Barbara County that had relationships with Fresno State uh, because they would send some of their grapes to Fresno and I just really, was there was making the wines for these growers. So what we decided to do is make it uh, more of a, a real focus. So I had the assignment then to work with the 
first vineyards, basically, not counting Muriel Nielsen, um, but uh, uh, Zaka Mesa, Firestone, and you know, uh, uh, Dean Brown, if you remember him, and those. Um, to make, we made, we set off to make four wines, Riesling, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Cabernet. And we made those for a couple of years from each, each one of those grapes that the, the vineyards had. And, um, you know, it, we had really not a clear idea how it was going to turn out because there, were, there really were no wines made at that point in Santa Barbara County. Uh, Uriel Nielsen was selling his grapes. Nielsen Vineyard, the oldest vineyard in Santa Barbara County, Uriel planted in 1964. But those grapes were all being sold to Brother Timothy at the Christian Brothers Winery, which I to just make a little segue here is the reputation for Santa Barbara County actually de was developed in the Napa Valley in, by the, the winemakers there because Brother Tim was telling me, God, it, this Chardonnay that comes off these vineyards is just so incredible. Uh, there wasn't any Pinot Noir there. And so, you know, the reputation for Chardonnay from Santa Barbara County just rocketed in, the, in those early years before we even started making wines here from our own wineries. So probably yeah. like uh, Santa Barbara Chardonnay making Napa better since 1964? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, can, can, <laughs> I want to maintain my relationships. Uh, of course, of course. <laughs> anyway, so that, that was kind of a, a sort of that, when that happened, then I really got to know something like Marshall Ream in particular, who owned Zaka Mesa. He, he and Dean Brown and um, some of the other um, owners of the vineyards I was working with, the wines really turned out nicely, even the first year, which you wouldn't anticipate because that was the first crop off these young vineyards. And the Riesling was, it was really, really, really nice. Chardonnays are really good. Pinots, you know, oh God, you know, these are really nice too. The Cabernet, no bueno. Yeah. <laughs> we just, we had no idea how, um, how cold it was in Santa Maria, Santa Rita. And just we were, where, we were, where we had the vineyards was well suited for Chardonnay. Sure. So most of these, the, the uh, Cabernet was the most widely planted uh, varietal in Santa Maria Valley. And this is going back to really when the big explosions happened was in the early part of the 70s. And you probably know this, Wes, but the Bank of America came out with this report basically that said, we believe in the California wine industry and we're willing uh, to finance uh, uh, people that want to buy land and plant vineyards. And, you know, basically uh, Bank of America really got the uh, Central Coast wine industry uh, moving. And most of the investors that were buying the land and planting vineyards and working with the B of A money were really big insurance companies. So um, mm. B of A was pretty good shape. It was that and that prudential and those. So it was an interesting way how we started off, but we started off with big developments, you know, rather than the small than what we see now in mostly in Santa Rita Hills. So it was it was a whole different world. Anyway, um, it was the uh, second year of producing those wines just further underscored how good these wines were. And um, some, of the, some of the growers go, God, you're really a good winemaker. These wines are good. I go, well, thank you, but it's not me, it's your grapes. And these are really, really, really good grapes. So I was just, you know, all of us that were part of that were just, you know, just like, this is really amazing. So that's how it started. We were kind of, you know, kind of giddy. And uh, so then uh, Marshall Ream asked me to uh, be his winemaker and put the winery together and do all that. So um, <laughs> I remember the day he took me up on this reservoir. We're looking at all beautiful Zaka Mesa uh, up into the, you know, the mountains up there. And uh, he said, you know, I'd like to have you be my winemaker and you can you know, have free reign to design the winery, pick out the equipment, put, put it all together. And he said, would you be interested? And I kind of had to pinch myself. Said, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Where's the country? No, it was a, so it was just kind of that magic moment. So that was in 77. And then um, we, um, it took about a year and a half to get all the permits and get the wine built. So uh, Zaka Mesa was finished oh, about a week late of the 78 vintage starting. Uh, PG&A didn't hook us up quite fast enough. 
and uh, we they get some pretty ripe grapes. But you know, I stand back now and look at the that first vintage, the 78 vintage we made at Zuck and made some incredible wines. Part of the reason was this young green winemaker wasn't getting too anxious and picking the grapes too early. They were well, fully developed with you know, amazing wines, pretty incredible. So that's kind of how that all started. And then, um, so yeah, I started uh, then in 1977 with Zaka Mesa. And uh, at that point, Zaka Mesa was making their wines at the Monterey uh, Vineyard, or the Monterey uh, uh, Vineyard Winery. And Dr. Peterson was actually the winemaker. Dick. And he really, you know, super guy. He was trained by Andre Chalachev, so it's not. Uh, a uh, Dick Peterson, I think, knows more about California wine than anyone I've ever met. He is a walking encyclopedia. Yeah. So it was really great to have him. Kind of not that I used him much, but I always knew he was there. That's kind of that sort of support me, because you know, I, even though at uh, Fresno State we had our own winery, yeah. uh, so Paul Dolan and I ended up managing the winery, which was really kind of cool. Um, but you, know, you learn a lot about what does, it, that's where you want to learn what doesn't work. But we learned also what does work. And the, the equipment that was donated to Fresno State was all commercial, you know, presses and pressures and pumps and all, this, all that. So when I started working and you know, doing the Zaka Mesa thing, I had a pretty good background, but it was my first real winery. And, uh, you know, just had, I think, some basic intuition of what to do and you know the experience that I had that the, the all of the wines that we made in the first vintage all turned out to be really good wines and, and thank you to everybody that prayed with me in that kind of thing and then just we kind of uh, moved on from from there um, it's not like a mace in the early days but every competition we entered we got the best of show gold medals and that type of thing and, and it was just the right place at the right time really helped launch uh, Santa Barbara County. We were thinking in bigger picture rather than Santa Maria Valley. But I want to say I want to say that Fred Brander's wine won the first gold medal in Santa Barbara County, but I think Zach Mesa won the first Chairman's Award at uh, LA County Fair. So I think you guys kind of won the best of show. Although Fred may have gotten a gold medal before you guys did, I just remember. <laughs> being an early wine judge at LA County Fair. Oh, here comes the Zaka Mesa, gold, 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 double gold, beautiful. Yeah, so there weren't many of us in, in those years and Fred uh, uh, Brander was certainly a good friend and helped, helped me because the wines that we made at Monterey Vineyard of the 77 vintage, I wanted to bring them to, to Zaka Mesa and bottle them there, but Zaka Mesa wasn't ready yet. So I said, Fred, you think we could take them over that, because he had the, the San Jose Valley Winery, which is now called Calera. Calera. Uh, that's where Fred had his, you know, wine made. So anyway, um, the reason I brought that up is when we bottled the wines, I said, "Okay, Fred, uh, I see that the wine wine looks good. What about people to help us?" I said, "Oh yeah, well I've got a list. You can call some of the people here." And, you know, I kind of this he kind of asked you know some of the people he thought would make the help do the best job of helping out with the, the bottling. And the first one on the list was a guy you probably have heard of, Jim Clendenin. He's going to be on next week. Good, yeah. Well, tell him that uh, I have a fond memory of uh, a decent bottling that, line guy. Yeah, and he was actually um, he was at working in Ventura at the Firestone Tire you know, for Tire Company, wow. and and, and uh, when he came, I knew he, he was he began his passion about winemaking at that point. Um, and then when he and I became really good friends, and then I hired him to be uh, my assistant winemaker at Zaka Mesa. And then Zaka Mesa, from, from that first year, um, the University of Zaka Mesa, you probably, I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah. It, it was all, you know, it wasn't something I ever coined, um, but when I hired somebody, I did not have any interest in seeing their resume. I didn't want to see it. I wanted to talk to them and you know, one on one, and when that person was start talking about why do you like wine, what do you know about wine, and they start talking, you kind of this you know rise up, and and uh, you can see the excitement and enthusiasm. Okay, you see that that's what it takes for people to get turned on, have the endurance to be able to work the long hours during harvest and that type of thing. So um, 
then uh, Bob Lindquist was part of that. Uh, Adam Tolmack, Wayne Tanner, you know, I've mentored, I don't know, about 30 you know, people over the years who've gone on to, to be winemakers and have their own uh, winery. So that's one thing I'm really proud about. And I, whenever I could tell somebody that was my assistant winemaker, she said, what happens is it kind of, you kind of see him walking up and he says, uh, Ken, I'd like to talk to you. You know right then what the conversation's about. But every one of those people, when they, they were they were kind of like saying, I'm really, you know, I'm really sorry, I said, don't be. That's a great opportunity for you. Congratulations, I'm happy you're, you're getting that job. I always felt good about people being able to you know, launch, use the launch pad as Akamese and move up in their career. So that was a good place to be and a great time to be, at, be there. So. Trent, uh, transition to uh, Byron? Yes, so uh, Zonka Mesa, uh, we had uh, the board of directors were, it was an amazing board. It was on, the, there was a photo on the front of the, uh, before Marvin Schenken owned the Wine Spectre, Mass Spectator, it was owned by Bob, help me here, anyway. It was, uh, uh, it was like a tabloid. Okay. Um, and on the front was the picture of the Zaka Mesa Board of Directors, and the caption was the Dream Board. Well, the Dream Board consisted, Marshall was a, uh, had been just retired as Executive Vice President of Atlantic Richfield. Well, all of her, his buddies were the presidents and CEOs of all the big oil companies. So of, on that board were just, it's just incredible who is who in the oil business. And the only person that wasn't in the oil business was John Cushman, who happens to be the only person that was part of that that's still there and now owns Zaka Mesa. Uh, but of course, his fame and fortune is in real estate development. He's a you know, national uh, company. So it was, it was an incredible board, but as you might expect, with the power of those people, lots of ego, and that you know, it was really hard to get things you know, moving forward without a lot of debate and that sort of thing. So one thing led to another, and um, Zaka Mesa, just everybody wanted to grow it and grow it. I, mean, I, you know, I tried to design the winery so it wouldn't be very easy to expand because I knew they wanted to do that. I was partly right. But um, so it got to the point where I was asked to go out and find other production sites so we could uh, increase the production of Zaka Mesa. And there weren't many other options. Uh, some of these places I looked at in Monterey and so forth had dirt floors and just not the place you want to make wine. So we ended up um, uh, having one good relationship that worked out for a while, uh, actually in, in Santa Maria with um, a person that owned a vineyard in the Santa Maria Valley, just had started a winery. But uh, so Dale Hampton, I think you know Dale Hampton. Dale's you know, a, a long time friend. Uh, his, he was always my go-to guy with any you know, kind of vineyard questions in the first, first part. Um, but he had a friend who wanted to uh, get a, per a permit to build a winery on this property. And his name is John Donovan. And uh, so Dale and John and I put together, I put the presentation together uh, to uh, the Santa Barbara County uh, Planning Commission and all that stuff. Um, and I'm putting this together and going, it took, it was kind of slow on the uptick here. I go, you know, this would be a great opportunity for me to just make that, do, do this for Zaka Mesa, you know, Zaka Mesa could have that excess capacity. And then I would start a new winery there. Because mm -hmm. I'd always say in the back of my mind, I'd start something just real small. And then, uh, so in uh, 1984, that we finished the construction of Byron, most of the production that was, being done in those years was Zaka Mesa's. But that's when I also started the Byron brand. And I think we started with 800 cases or something like that. Uh, and then uh, uh, that just grew and grew and grew. And it, that was pretty, you know, it was totally open with Zaka Mesa. They knew what I was doing. They were grateful that I was doing this. So they had the capacity and they knew I was there taking care of it. So I was, I was you know, the winemaker for Zaka Mesa and also for their expansion project there. So. Um, I've always I lived in San Jose Valley, and I drive by Zaka Mesa, write the work orders, meet with the crew, get them started, and then you know, spend the rest of the day at Byron, work on the wines, 
and then come back late afternoon, sign off on the work orders and make sure we knew where everyone was and that kind of thing. But, so that, that went on for a couple of years, but it really worked well. And then um, you know, one thing led to another kind of Zaka Mason, some might say maybe grew a little bit too fast as some winers have a tendency to do. And um, so it just got to the point where um, I thought it was a good time for me to step down from Zaka Mason, kind of put more full-time focus in the buyer. So um, we ended up, the property that John Donovan owned is where the, the Byron Winery is now. It was a 10 acre piece of property. Yeah, but, anyway. uh, but in the meantime, I've become good friends with Uriel Nielsen and we're buying grapes from him to make wines at Zaka Mesa and for my new project. Um, and Uriel was just, Uriel's one of the sweetest guys you've, you've ever met. I don't know if you ever had a chance to meet him. Uriel, again, was uh, planted the first vineyard, the Nielsen Vineyard in Santa Barbara County. It's a you know, historic vineyard. The first one was planted in 1964. So it was way ahead of anyone else because then we're talking about the next generation. It's really early, early 70s. And, you know, the Tepescades and you know, all those were planted. Uh, but anyway, so Uriel and I, as I said, became good friends. And he said, Ken, you know, this has been my passion to be able to grow these grapes. Uriel, by the way, was a bit of cultures from day he was trained at Davis, so he knew, knew what he was doing. Um, but um, he um, decided that it was time for he was getting on in years, and he decided he wanted to sell it. But he said, Ken, I'm going to make you an offer you're not going to be able to refuse. And I go, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, it's time for me to, to sell the vineyard. I know you've made great wines, and I want the, my vineyard to go into good hands. And I'd love it if you'd be able to buy it. And I said, well, <laughs> what are you asking? And uh, it was just like, it was just like, oh my God. He, when he said that, I said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely. And I said, done. So we ended up, it was just, he gave us, he, what he said is you're not going to be able to refuse it. He was right. So um, it was just a, the kind of, you know, another hugely lucky break in, in my career. So anyway, so uh, we had a partnership at Byron that we brought um, another partner in, uh, it was Dale Hampton and uh, one other partner and then brought the third, fourth partner, partner in actually. And that's when we decided to expand the Byron Winery. So we went from being able to produce about 8,000 cases to about 20,000 with the ex expansion. And, and so anyway, then um, what happened is, um, we were, you know, we we're getting still really good reviews and, and our, the, the people that ended up buying Tepesque was sold half of the East half, which was the half that was by Byron Winery and the Nielsen Vineyard was sold to the Bondavi family. And then the West half was sold to uh, the, the Jackson family and then the, the Cambria. And then, uh, so uh, I'm not, I won't spend too much time on this, but long story short is, um, so Tim and I decided we wanted to link up somehow together. And um, I didn't want to be a partner because their wealth far exceeded mine and you need that partnerships work better if there's good balance. And I said, you know, you know I, I, really, I really think you, the Mondavi family at that point, they're just, uh, Robert was, you know, just the leader, the company was leader in viticulture, technology, marketing, uh, branding. At that point in time, they were the leader in almost everything. And so I thought, well, uh, why don't I tell you what, uh, Tim, um, if this, if you're interested in buying, we'd be interested in selling. So it kind of got to that point. And that's how we ended up selling to them. So lock, stock, and all the barrels. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and that was January, uh, in January 25th, 1990. I think Estro closed at about 1.37 in the afternoon. If I remember right. <laughs> but anyway, so that, and I, I, we didn't have to sell, but I wouldn't have sold to any other family. I, I know Tim, I knew Robert, and I just felt it was going to be really a good relationship. And it really did work out all through, you know, the 90s. It was just, everything was, was great. Uh, we built the new winery uh, in the vineyard. Uh, it's a total gravity winery, which was, really designed for Pinot Noir, but you could do anything there. Uh, finished that in 97. 
But then if you remember the dot-com crash hit kind of at the end of the 90s, and um, I didn't say this, Mondavi went public in 93. And that's why we could do a lot. We had a lot more of this public money to work with. So uh, it, was, it was a wonderful time to be there. I just I did, was able to do a lot of research and the vineyards plant new varietals, rootstock, and really worked out a lot of you know, road direction, rootstock clone, trellis design, figured out in Santa Maria Valley, especially for Pinot Noir, what the best of all those you know, were. Um, and the person that was heading up our research program uh, was uh, Clarissa Guffey, who was the uh, assistant winemaker at Firestone, and hired her the same day that I hired my enologist, who his name, of course, is Jonathan Nagy. <laughs> you may know the story. But um, so um, both of them about the same age, you know, single, you know, both love wine. And I said, drove them around when they first started that day. And I said, okay, I want you guys to spend time in the vineyard. I want you to get to be familiar with the pattern of you know, the evolution of each one of these blocks. I mean, the vineyard. So they were happy to do that. And after a couple of months, I'm like, these guys are sure spending a lot of time out in the vineyard. This is great, you know, boy. So anyway, long story short, uh, on my resume, I'm not only a winemaker, but I'm a matchmaker <laughs> because they got married. And a godfather. Yeah, and then, uh, I have the sweetest daughter. So they're just the, the, some of the most wonderful people I've ever met. It's a pleasure to work with them. But th that was just a wonderful time to be there. Had you know great crew and every and a lot of work. You know, we did a lot with the research program. But um, it, you know, Mondavi want, never said no. So sure. I said go go go. <laughs> anyway, what, so what do you as far as as far as the transition into the Ken Brown wines? Um, <laughs> Is there anything that you weren't able to do at Byron that you were able to do at Ken Brown? Or is the Ken Brown transition just a, another chapter of doing what you've always done in your winemaking? I'm thirsty. Oh yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, uh, let's put some uh, 2017 Ken Brown Pinot Noir. Oh, hey, look, the, uh, could, could you pour it into this glass? Oh, I already have some. Appellated. I hope, uh, I yeah, hope. Uh, day drinking. Don't stand on ceremony. If you feel like drinking, get I'm, it on. I don't, I will not hesitate. Cheers. My Cheers. good buddy, Wes Hagen. Okay, Perfect so segment. we'll talk about the Santa Rita Hills. We do this, what we call um, an Appalachian blend. It's all Santa Rita Hills. Um, and, you know, uh, a lot of people know this, but some don't, is that if if, if we have a vineyard designate, like if we were doing Clos Pepe Vineyard, 95% of those grapes have to come from that vineyard. If you're using an Appalachian such as Santa Rita Hills, then it's, it's not a government one. It's, it's one that's been formed by the local owners and growers and that type of thing. Uh, so that would be an example, Santa Rita Hills. That has to be at least 85% grapes from the AVA. Um, if you're a county, if you call it Santa Barbara County, and it depends on whether you're vintage dating these or not, but we always said vintage, they have, it has to be 75% uh, from, well, it has to be 75% from Santa Barbara County. So we were, so early on is I found that once I started getting interested in, and started Ken Brown wines, because I wanted, I, even though Zaka Mace, or excuse me, Byron was just a perfect place to be. Uh, same thing happened at Zaka Mesa for me, and I'm speaking to me personally. I never viewed having a large winery. That was more the personal hands-on and kind of want to know each vine and each barrel and that type of thing. So I just, you know, that's kind of why I started, fell into it, but started Byron Winery is um, uh, Zaka Mesa got pretty close to 90,000 cases. And, on and on, but but I had a good time to, to make my break, and then kind of the same thing happened at Byron. They're just very successful, but they got up to about that same amount of cases. But then the dot com crash hit, and since they went public, uh, when the stock market tanked, uh, it's it's virtually impossible. It's impossible for anybody to be able to raise prices, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, have your stock continue to go up 
during a recession. So it's not going to happen. So then the, um, and which is what you do for as a public company responsible to shareholders, you have to figure out ways to optimize your margins or the profits. So you cut back in your expenses. Well, I wasn't real happy with some of the things they were asking us to cut back. I understood why, but it just wasn't what I wanted, but it was in from the vineyard standpoint and the winery standpoint. And uh, I gotta say my good buddy, Tim, and I were kind of on the same page. Tim, last name was Bandavi. He couldn't believe my last name wasn't Bandavi. Uh, so I did, and it was, you know, it was a, a, a tough decision on my part because I was very happy with the whole situation. If the dot-com crash hadn't happened, I probably would have still been there because it just got tough on everybody. And uh, when I announced to Tim that I was going to go start my own winery all over again, he said, oh, you're breaking my heart. <laughs> so anyway, so we started, uh, uh, we don't have partners in Ken Brown. It's just my wife and myself. So um, we, when I was still at Zaka Mesa, we started with the 03 vintage and the 04 vintage, but we're made of bio. Mm. Okay. So then um, uh, my agreement with Wandavi was that once I released wines, I would step down because you can't wear the, you know, the Byron hat and then turn around and have the Ken Brown. Ken Brown. See, Byron's not on the back anymore. Okay. Uh, All right. So uh, anyway, um, so we, we started off, the Ken Brown brand started off actually quite small. We started off 3,000 cases such as that, but it was all focused on Santa Rita Hills primarily. Um, I was still uh, getting some Pinot Noir from uh, Bienecito and from, um, from Byron. And we made a blend every year that we called the Santa Barbara blend under the Ken Brown brand. Well, the problem was, you know, over half of that was uh, Santa Rita Hills, which is pretty expensive, a little more expensive, generally speaking, than Santa Maria Pinot Noir. So we had terrible margins on that. And it just, it was the blend was great, but I'm going. We have to call it Santa Barbara County if we're going to make the blend between the two AVAs. So we actually got to the point where I just felt that, from a sustainability standpoint for Ken Brown brand, we had to end up dropping Santa Barbara County and kind of then making our I don't want to say our lowest price wine. The, yeah, the, 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 Santa, the Santa Rita Hills. So, mm -hmm. so this is our, our, in the blend, it's always a blend. It's never the same in any one year. But what we're not doing is buying inexpensive grapes, which a lot of people would do with their low end, uh, or buy bulk wine. We're always, we work with the best vineyards and I wish we still worked with Club Pepe, but that's another, yeah. <laughs> another story. Anyway, so this is a blend. I'm gonna go to my notes here briefly. Um, so this is 50% Rio Vista. Rio Vista is always a vineyard that I want to be a core of our, our Santa Rita Hills because we're going to bottle it about at 10, 11 months in barrel before the next vintage. And Santa Rita Hills, generally speaking, have quite a bit of, of structure to them. So a lot of times you need a little bit more time in barrel, but if you've got Rio Vista at the far east end, so it'd be called the warmer end, I call it the less cold or the cool end. Uh, but the the, uh, the Rio Vista Pinots are just very beautiful, rich, opulent style of Pinots. I've never made a Rio Vista vineyard designate uh, because I've been consulting to the, fan, uh, the people that own Rio Vista, uh, the Thorne family, and for quite a few years making their wines. I don't want to have a competition between the two of them. So anyway, uh, the, the San Rita Hills then has a blend, 50% Rio Vista. 25% Rita's Crown, 10% Radian, 10% Sanford and Benedict, 5% Rancho Lavinia, all really, really good Santa Rita. Amazing. So that, that when, we're never cutting corners. Um, this isn't a big profit line. Uh, margins are, you know, we don't lose money on it, but we don't make a lot of money. This is our largest production. Ken Brown brand, as I said, we started off with over 3,000 cases, got up to about four or 5,000. We're the only brand I think that can brag that everybody says, well, we've grown from you know, 3,000 to 50,000 or whatever. I'm proud to say we have reduced our production from about a little over 4,000 cases to about 2,500 cases. And that's all we want to do. And uh, to have, well, the reason that we want to do that 
is we only have one distributor that's in California. It's Wine Warehouse, great distributor. Um, we, in our, to the total wines that we sell, um, most, about 70% is direct, 30% is wholesale. It's all California. Uh, when we first started uh, Ken Brown brand and flying to New York and Chicago, and you're just totally losing money when you, when you have to go wholesale and spend, go to New York and you know, spend a thousand dollars a night for hotels. And you always have to take out some of the best wine, uh, the best salesperson for the lunches or the dinners. You do a lot of entertainment, it's really expensive. So that's not, that's not gonna cut it for. So that kind of put us into the situation of going, okay, the only way we can accomplish what we wanna do is be financially viable, but be a small brand is optimize the direct sale. And so we've got the exposure, the visibility, almost look like look at it as a marketing cost um, that, that we sell about 30% of our wine through Wine Warehouse. And then the rest of it is all direct through the tasting room, wine club, and online and you know, phone call stuff. So um, it's good formula and the 2,500 cases, it works perfectly. And I would say that you were probably ahead of the game as far as everybody else pivoting to direct to consumer. You were doing that in significantly in a pre uh, in a pre COVID pre quarantine world. So that's yeah. that obviously. I don't want to run out of time, but I would just, this kind of reminds me what you just brought up is going back to before I went to Fresno State in, in some of these tasting groups. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I really wanted to then also visit some. Uh, wineries and some of the first wineries I went to I wanted to go to small family wineries but most of the wineries whether they were small or the Louis Martinis or uh, the BVs or whatever my commas they didn't have tasting rooms in those days <laughs> nobody had tasting room which you call you need to make an appointment which is nice you were dealing with crowds but uh, invariably what turned me on early on about the wine business um, really sold me is when I would call some of these small wineries and say, you know, um, we'd love to come by and taste some of your wines and what's a good time for you asking them, well, why don't you come by around 10 or 11 and then we'll taste out a barrel and then if you can join us for lunch, that'd be great. You know, so that's how, <laughs> so lunch was in, in the kitchen in the, uh, you know, the winemakers houses that were on the vineyards. So you got this intimate relationship having lunch at their kitchen table and really getting to know these families. And then you know, back up to the earlier part of my career was IBM as a corporation, incredible company experience. I, I never regret doing that. Um, but there it isn't, you're not, you don't have that small business feeling um, and you're always, you're always safeguarding all of your proprietary information from your competitors. The wine business isn't that way. We all we share everything. Um, I, there, there are only two wineries that I visited that wouldn't share with me. And I know, and I, maybe I shouldn't mention the name, but Gallo for good reason doesn't. They have a, a lot of research. Um, I got to know them pretty well, so I was able to talk to them about some of the things they were doing. Um, but and then the other one I won't mention, <laughs> but. Uh, it was, a, it was a Pinot Noir winemaker that wouldn't, didn't want to talk about his or her winemaking. And I thought, has, has that been around the world? You know, vineyards and winers, everybody likes to share. Now, whether they tell you the truth <laughs> situation, especially in Burgundy. That was another story for another time. Um, but I've been, to, I've been to Burgundy more than a few times. And um, um, one of the things I should share with you is I fell in love with Pinot Noir a long time ago. And uh, I mean, had the good fortune of having some great Beaumars with one of the tasting groups I was in and, you know, Mousigny and uh, all it, and the great uh, Burgundies. So once you get plugged into that, you gotta fall in love with them. They're just the greatest wines in the world. Uh, problem is I can't afford them anymore. <laughs> you can buy 10 Burgundies and uh, seven of them are even from the good vintage and, and good producers. And then you spend, then the other three might be, two of them might be really good, but one of them gets you coming back again because you spent maybe a couple hundred dollars, but it's just an incredible bottle. So we get hooked into that, but I, I've always loved Pinot. Uh, Pinot Noir is a great, um, it's, um, what to me is fascinating is we work with uh, quite a few different Santa Rita Hill Pinot Noir vineyards. 
And what I'm looking for is vineyards that will audition for a couple of years, but I want consistency um, in the expression and the quality. So what we're trying to do is find a unique signature that is unlike any other Santa Rita Hills vineyard that we're working with. It's really pretty easy to do, as you know, Wes, that uh, vineyard right next to Clopepe does not make the same, they're totally different. Pinot Noir, for better, for worse, has the, expresses the site more profoundly than any other varietal. Uh, just, you know, which can be really a good thing, it can really be a bad thing. Because if you don't get everything dialed in, so a little bit of it is luck, even though you do the backhoe pits and soil studies and you know, climatic studies and that. Um, but uh, the vineyards we work with, I think are all really good vineyards. I'm always, you know, keeping my eye open, but I don't want to make too many uh, vineyards, uh, vineyard destinates. Um, uh, one of the vineyards I really regretted um, having to uh, leave was Clopepe because the handwriting was, was on the wall. So Wes, could I just, do you mind if I, if it can't, you probably can't read that label. Read, uh, lift it up a little bit. A little, a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. Oh yeah, there, oh man. You mind if I take a sip? So let me, let me give you two minutes. Basically then I'm gonna ask you a couple, a couple okay. of good Okay, sure, okay. First of all, um, so we did in uh, 2005, I came together with 13 other collectors and in Long Beach, California, we tasted 78 different Clopepe wines from 10 different vintages from eight different producers. Um, we wow. all talked about, I mean, uh, we had most wines that were ever made from Clopepe, and then we, we talked about style, the estate wines, um, Siduri, AP Vin, um, you know, your wines, uh, Brewer Clifton, you name it. I mean, uh, the folks that made uh, Clopepe, there was consensus that your wines, the, that the Clopepe vineyard designates from Ken Brown, one, the, the idea, who was making a wine that shows the expression of the vineyard the most accurately? Um, you were number one, Siduri was number two. Interestingly, that you both worked very closely with Jackson family at, at one point or another. But I, I found that um, fascinating that I thought that your focus, and you know me, I mean, anytime you would come out to the vineyard um, to do a little walk around and see what was going on and ride me a little bit to get the cultural practices done a little faster than perhaps some of the other some of the other uh sections i think was profound because anytime i walked the vineyard with you i learned something so i really appreciate that and speaking of learning okay. culture i would say as far as any winemaker i've worked with except maybe adam tolmack you've probably taught me more about my own vineyard management um we've got a lot of people who watch the show who are home winemakers and home viticulturists if you were going to say this is going to be really tough to compact into a minute or two, if you had one piece of advice for a home wine grower and one piece of advice for a home winemaker, what would you suggest to them? Well, um, Dr. Peterson, I asked him that question way back when, and the answer I thought was a little strange. I really had to think about it. He said, be particular. Like, okay. Okay, and that's always resonated uh, in my mind. And so, but it's part of my nature. Um, I spend a lot of time in the vineyards, as you know, but I have to, because I wanna see how the, the vineyard, that each vineyard is evolving through this year of its life, because it's important. Because when you get down to the time that you're starting to pick all your vineyards and Santa Rita Hills, Fortunately, they'll be spread out by, by about 30 days, but you've got to be on your toes to know which one is probably going to crash a little bit earlier just because you've kind of been in to see the vineyard you know, every week to see what's happening to it. So just, you, you know a lot about the vineyard before you bring the grapes into, into the winery. And that's, in my experience, that's been crucial. Um, so spend time, um, be particular, uh, Focus, time, focus, be particular. The focus is a big part. When I'm in the vineyard, I'm really looking at the vines and how the thing's shaping up. Um, and then um, same is true at, at the winery side is um, there, I, I think some people will ask me, so what do you do 
you know, when all the grapes are picked, all the wines are bottled, and you know, you finally got everything packed away. Well, this isn't the answer that most people want to hear, but more often than not, when that couple of weeks happens, it's usually right around the holidays, um, is both Deb and I, you know, we are owners of a business. So we're going to be in our offices mm-hmm. trying to catch up with, you know, all the uh, uh, reporting, uh, compliance, uh, the bookkeeping aspects. So we don't do, we don't really travel much, but just for sanity purposes, at least once every three years, um, we'll go to no, Hawaii. I, Hawaii off to Hula Daddy, the coffee well, plantation. The, I won't Hula. do it, but the back of the shirt is amazing. This t-shirt. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. I love the particular. Uh, particular to means that you're paying attention to every aspect. That's right. Yeah. You're, not, you're not wasting time, but you're not losing time. And if you see something in the vineyard and in the winery that needs to be taken care of, it happens right away. Well, I'll, also, I think what's important is sometimes you hear people say, oh, I think that's okay. No. Well, my comment would always be is, you know, it's either right or wrong. Let's find out what the right answer is so we don't make the wrong decision. And that's, and, that, and I suppose that can bug people sometimes, but I think they get it. And that's um, one of the reasons that we've been, I think, fairly successful is it is about focus and being particular and, and spending time. And yes, I have I'm, I'm not complaining. I love, I love very much uh, in the vineyards and being there, and especially now that we're you know kind of sheltered at home. I get to, I, I feel like get I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Talk about six feet separation. When I'm out in our vineyards, there may not be another person within a mile of me. It's just you know, it's so open, beautiful country out there. That's when I can regenerate. I don't have to wear a face mask or anything. And it's just such, it keeps me going right now, but it always has. So anyway, that's kind of, I've kind of jumped around. Wes? No problem. Um, we got a question from our audience. Uh, when, you, uh, when you source your grapes, do you purchase grapes from a vineyard? Do you ask them to make sure that they will take your advice before you sign the contract or um, are, what 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 demands do you make of a vineyard before you sign a multi-year contract, or do you? Well, I I, just, I don't. I kind of hate to put it this way, but um, I think a lot of the vineyards I work with, I'm working with them because I think they're good sites. I think that they have good vineyard management. You've got to have both of those. A great site without good vineyard management, I'm not interested in, because I can only do so much. Uh, but I will meet. Um, you know, we just started working with uh, Peak Vineyard and uh, uh, John Sebastiano Vineyard a couple of years ago. And uh, that, they were, I wanted to work with those. I tasted the wines, uh, especially now the vineyard management is, is really, really incredible. Um, so anyway, um, I don't, I mean, I, I, it's not that I, I'm telling people, but I'll just, you know, I'll take the, the manager or, or usually the manager or the owner into the block I'm working with and go, okay, here's what I'd like to do. And, do, 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 you know, pull leaves on this side, don't on that side or whatever it is. And, um, you know, I think a lot of them have confidence in that I've been doing this for a few years and I know what I'm doing. And so it's a, it's a, it works. I don't, I don't get any pushback. Good. Uh, well, I, mean, I think, you know, uh, you know, when uh, E.F. Hutton speaks, that's just all I'm saying. Um, I've got okay. questions and we're gonna do the, um, we're gonna do the uh, speed round. If anyone has any questions, make sure you load them up uh, sooner than later. Because so we're gonna do the Syrah? We're gonna be finishing. Yes, let's get some Syrah on the glass. We have, why don't okay. you tell I us? Have my glass just happened to. 2000, okay. 2016 Ken Brown, uh, Santa Barbara County Syrah, the A Cuvée. So A Cuvée is a proprietary blend. And- uh, I'll let you talk about this for 30 seconds. I'll be you got right. it, okay. And um, the A part of the title, A Cuvée, um, make this quick, my um, youngest daughter, uh, when she went off to college, she came back one spring break and I was, had this idea of having a proprietary blend of Syrah. And I thought, you know, I think I'm gonna call her name's Alicia. I'm gonna call it Alicia's Cuvée. And uh, I said, so Alicia, what do you think of this, of this idea? And she's, 
and she she was what 19 something like that um she said oh yeah mm, you know she wasn't as confident a woman as she is definitely now she's a professional um so i said okay you know no problem so what i decided to do the ACUVE stands for Alicia. She knows that, uh, but she's no longer embarrassed. Uh, I have a feeling she's going to go, you know, Dad, I've been thinking, can we call this Alicia's CUVE now? I, and I'm just kidding about that. But, so anyway, that's how the name started. The, the, the idea of the blend is we're working with usually Happy Canyon, um, um, Syrah, and uh, Syrah from Los Alamos AVA, Sun AVA uh, Valley. It is soon to be an ABA, but that's, it's a fairly cool, it's right just to the east of Los Alamos. So you do get some marine influence. There's quite a bit of difference in climate between the two. And then outside of this one, I've always co-fermented with uh, some Viognier. It's usually about 4%, 5% is a little too much, three is not enough. We, use, we always do the tasting, but it's usually about 4%. This doesn't have, it's the first one that we didn't do it that way. So this one is a blend, but it's, a, I'm gonna call it 50-50, Watch Hill, which um, people that have had Watch Hill Syrahs are really, really nice, plush, lush uh, style. And it's in Los, Al uh, Los Alamos Valley. And very close to it is the Thompson Vineyard. Mm -hmm. And we're working with um, Own Rooted Thompson, which I won't get into that with this conversation, but in the trials that we did um, at Byron, um, own rooted versus uh, resistant rootstock turned out most more often than not to make the best wine. Totally different topic for a different time because it has some uh, ramifications to say that. So anyway, this is a blend of uh, Thompson yep. and Watch Hill. Oh, yeah. No, that's that's it, it's 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 really generous and uh, and delicious. I like how it kind of rides that beautiful line between old world and new world. It sort of has old world complexity and a lot of new world fruit. It's generous. You can taste some warmth in it, but it is not overwrought. It's not overripe. I've got one last question for you. And then I have a question from the audience and then bam, speed round. Um, in a Matt Ketman interview uh, with the uh, independent and wine enthusiast, you said, uh, in the old wine spectator, it would have ranked as one of the best, but if we were making that Pinot now, no one would ever come here. What did you mean by that? Oh, well, we're talking about Pinot Noir. Right. So the early Pinot Noirs, any place in California, almost any place, there were a few exceptions, were not very good wines. And... Um, the, the one, we actually made Pinot Noir at Zaca Mesa. Zaca Mesa is a fairly warm site, but we did pretty exotic things with turning on irrigation at the right time to cool down in you know, the vineyard, the grapes, and not have it be there overnight where it would ca cause you know, mildew or botrytis. So, uh, I mean, they turned, we got some really good, good reviews on the early Pinot Noirs. But the point is the competition at that point wasn't that great either. So, uh, you know, it's a whole different world now. Um, I think the big difference was most of us that are California winemakers or Oregon winemakers, I mean, the difference. Um, when we go to Burgundy, I think most of us walk right past the answer to what makes great Burgundy when we knock on that winery door and say, I'm here, let's go in and taste some wines. And then you start talking about what makes Burgundy great. It's, it's that vineyard that you know, starts it all. And it wasn't until we really started dialing in where uh, to grow. Pinot Noir obviously needs the coolest climate of all. Uh, Santa Rita Hills, uh, Radian Pinot Noir comes off the furthest west vineyard. And, it, and like I can say, it's probably the coldest vineyard, uh, Pinot Noir vineyard in the west coast of the United States. And that's, you know, they're going, well, this is Santa Barbara County, have can be transverse valleys, transverse valleys, transverse valleys, that's what it's all about. And that's why we have such an interest. Everybody, every winemaker or owner talks about their unique climate and that Nobody can top us for having a unique climate. These transverse valleys make a huge difference. If we had a coast range block in marine influence here, we would not be making Pinot Noir whatsoever. But uh, because, um, the winds are coming in right off the Pacific. 
to the west of, of uh, Lompoc, it's still very cold ocean water. Uh, so we have we don't start if you're up in Occidental in parts of, of Oregon, you can plant on the first ridge next to the Pacific Ocean, but those ridges are all going east west. They aren't directly open to the ocean. So it is here that we are planting uh, the. The furthest west vineyard is still east of Lombok. So we're still 12 miles or 15 miles from the ocean. And it's not for any other reason that we, we know if we go too much further west, we won't have enough heat, heat units to ripen Pinot Noir even in a warm year when we get that far west. So we're, you know, we're tiptoeing there. I think there are some vineyards for the future that can be planted a little bit further west than we're planting now. Uh, but I, I will have to say that we're perfectly positioned for global warming. <laughs> we can yeah, get no, as cold as we want. It's fantastic to see that there's so many great quality Pinot Noirs that are coming out. Uh, even in a post sideways world, um, we're, we're still kind of finding our way. But I, I think, you know, the quality of Pinot Noir has never been better and quality of wine has never been better. We're certainly in a golden age. So I want to thank, I want to thank Wes too. Uh, we've been friends for a long time. And I will say that one of the unique pleasures was when you and, and your, your parents would invite the wineries over the, to your place to meet with your wine club and run the, the pool area and uh, everybody have their own table and be able to taste their wines. That was really nice of you to do that. It was well, just you know, Robert Parker said, I made some of the uh, least impressive wines out of our vineyard. So I had to figure out what you guys were doing. So yeah. it, was, it was just, uh, yeah. Uh, I had a great question really quick from yeah. someone the audience, and this is a, uh, probably uh, an easy one to answer. Outside of Santa Barbara, outside of Burgundy, where do you like to drink Pinot Noir? What what ABA would probably? Well, um, I'm going to default to Oregon because I've done. A, we we uh, when we sold uh, um, uh, Byron Winery, we actually bought 75 acres up in the Willamette Valley, and I had that just in case it didn't work out with the Monavis. I kind of figured it would. It did, so we ended up selling it. But uh, I, I spent a lot of time uh, in the vineyards and wineries in the Willamette Valley, you know a lot of people there. And, you know, we came close to setting up shop in the Willamette Valley. Uh, I love the people, great wines, but you have too much from a business standpoint, uh, from a business plan, when you've got two out of 10 or whatever vintages that aren't good because you got rain at the wrong time. You know, it's on the same parallel as Burgundy, so it makes great wine, but you can also have really not so great of vintages. And I have had you know, enough experience here that I'm going, hey, we've got great vintage. We have incredible continuity, vintage after vintage. Uh, we're not, the uh, uh, jet stream isn't falling this far when you still have you know, grapes on the vines is far, fall this far west. So we typically don't get much rain at all. Our rainy season, but well, when it starts is what, you know, usually January, February, March. So we picked the grapes, you know, months ago. So one thing that I like to bring up, what a lot of people don't, is one of the reasons that I think there's so much interest in our wines is almost every vintage. They may, they're going to be a little bit different, but we don't have those really off vintages. So. No. When you buy a bottle of you know, Pinot Noir or whatever from uh, Santa Rita Hills or Syrah from um, Happy Canyon, you, you get to have, you're going to have a good wine because you didn't get this, the, the, the problems of bad weather. Okay. Well, it's going to be one AVA within the Willamette Valley. Would you call one out that makes your favorite Pinot? Mm, you know, um, the... Uh, like uh, Salem, the Canary Hill, that area, uh, um, some really good ones. But I also like um, the uh, the Dundee Hills. Dundee makes some amazing. Yeah. All right, here we're gonna, we're gonna go stuff. speed round. If you get, I got ten questions on the speed round. Just come say whatever comes into your uh, head quick. These are just one word answers generally. And if now, you who, get, a, is this to the audience, not to me? This is you. Yeah, and, oh, this yeah, is you. I got a thank you. If you get at least six out of ten. This is fun because I get to determine if your answer is correct and it's totally <laughs> arbitrary. Um, okay, and part sure. of it is from my study and my knowledge of Ken Brown as a man. So here we go. As long as you get six out of 10, you win free beer and at least one of those beers will be Pliny the Elder. If I don't, what do I lose? 
If you don't, well, you'll just have to deal with the fact that you were not able to answer six of Wes Hagen's questions uh, accurately. Oh my God, I don't know if I can stand the job. I don't know if you would or not, but it's fun. All right, what is the greatest protein in the world for matching with Pinot Noir? The greatest protein in the world? Well, uh, I am a big fan of salmon. And the correct answer is duck. Oh, um, well. Because you said duck, duck is your yeah. protein in an, in an interview. What's that? I thought you had said that duck was your favorite protein in, in an interview. Oh, it is. But, uh, you know, I don't know which came first, the salmon or the duck. Okay, I'm going to- Whichever did. Because I don't know if it was before or after Pinot. So. And I don't drink salmon south of Portland, or I don't eat salmon south of Portland. I don't like to drink salmon. But I'm going to give you half a point because salmon is the correct answer for the Willamette Valley. Um, how is it that we may have both slept in a dorm at Linfield College? Well, well, one answer is I went there to school and the International uh, uh, Pinot Noir Festival is- That is correct. I went to the IC. Slept in the Linfield- And it's also become the, the kind of the, the mecca for the Oregon wine industry, um, cool. McMinnville. Yeah. Who, was, who was the first- winemaker to introduce Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and Syrah to Santa Barbara County? Pinot Gris, um, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, and Syrah? Right. Um, oh yeah. You. <laughs> Ken Brown. Correct. Wow. Uh, you can only keep one grape variety in Santa Maria Valley and one in Santa Rita Hills. Why are the same? And, you know, what, what would you, you can only keep one grape in Santa Maria and one grape in Santa Rita Hills. Same grape, different grapes, what would you choose? Oh, for me, it'd be Pinot Noir and both. Pinot Noir and both. I'll give you yes, I'll give you a half a point there because Chardonnay, I think still is probably the best oh. grape. Yeah. Uh, time for one meal in your hometown of Sacramento, Biba, Waterboy, or Firehouse? Uh, Biba. Absolutely correct, I miss Biba already. I do Finish too. the sentence, a, Pinot, a perfect Pinot Noir should be a perfect Pinot Noir. You know, it should be like, I haven't, Wes I think knows what this is, but um, this one has, was not available for anybody to purchase. And I hope people had a chance to purchase the 17 Santa Rita and the 16 A Cuvée. But this wine that I am drinking, I couldn't help myself. Um, I have so much respect for Wes and the, the experience that I had at Clo Pepe. This in my glass, Wes, can, I wish you could, arms were longer. <laughs> That's me a taste. This is the 2012 Club Pepe Pinot Noir. So this That's is what it looks point. like. And I want to tell you, I, I don't, I mean, you probably have some of your Club Pepe 12s. They're, they're just gorgeous wines still. They're tasting really nice now. I will go ahead and give you full credit for that for my own narcissism, so thank you. Okay, who did the most for California wine? Robert Parker, Robert Mondavi, Andre Telechev, Clark Smith, or Agustin Harasli? Jeez, depends on what, I mean, um, Andre Telechev from a yep. wine making standpoint, it has to be. Robert Mondavi from a marketing and taking making California wines known on the table, the um, dinner tables of the world. That was his mission. And he did a pretty darn good job of that. I'd say Parker got a lot of California wine in people's mouths too, but yeah, no, but Telechef yeah, was- Parker was, didn't have a lot of international friends. Better wine movie, Sideways, Bottle Shock, or French Kiss? <laughs> French Kiss. <laughs> I'm gonna give you half on that. I would have also accepted Bottle Shock. Sideways did for Santa Barbara Pino what the Soviet Union did for socialism. What's more important in a marriage, honesty or willingness? <laughs> I'm going to say honesty. <laughs> my wife agrees, which means you get a full point. And the last question, you've got one, two, three, four, five. You're already in. So this doesn't even matter, but it's, it, it is important. Who is Victor E. Bulldog? Victor E. Bulldog? Yeah, who's Victor E. Bulldog? Well, when I think of Bulldog, I think of, of Don, who developed the Bulldog pup. pup. But I don't think that's what you're referring to. I'll give you one more chance. Victor E. Bulldog? Yep. 
Victor E. Bulldog. Well, I knew some of your dogs, and I don't recall any of them are Victor. No, you, it's, it's lucky you already had six points. Victor E. Bulldog is the current mascot of Cal State Fresno. Oh, Victor? Victor <laughs> and it was a bulldog. From, but that's about it. Oh, come I, on. All of the, the questions, we had a couple little questions come in late. I will make sure you know. Uh, let's see, who are some, okay, you've got that one. We did that, we did that. Um, the question uh, from Wade was, where do we get water for the vines in the Santa Rita Hills? Um, I will tell you right now that I know that our well at Clopepe was um, pulling water from about 230 feet before we left and our well was struggling a little bit to get clean water. There is a aquifer within the Santa Rita Hills that is fed by the San Inez River mm -hmm. and that aquifer is carefully watched by the San Inez Water Conservation Country District water. where we have fill out yep. forms of how much water we take out and they're constantly measuring it. It is seriously in a drought situation. I don't know anyone in the Santa Rita Hills that have end up having a dry well, but it is uh, something that we have to be really careful of. Yeah, there've been a couple have been on the edge, especially somebody like um, Rita's Crown, where on that property, it's too high up. So you have to have easements and access to wells that are near the river, and then you have big pumping stations to get the water up, which is expensive. But you know, so far we've managed, but hey, we need rain, always need, always need rain at the right time of year. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. Unfortunately, in Santa Barbara, we don't get rain or hail at the wrong time. So Ken, yeah. I want to thank you so much for being here, for taking a little extra time. My, my pleasure. Thank you, Wes. And thank you to all the people who tuned in. Tell yeah. us how we can find these uh, wonderful wines. Well, of course, we do have a tasting room in uh, Bilton. Uh, we're not open right now, uh, but we do offer curbside pickup. And you can go to our website, um, Ken Brown wines.com and get a, get that information. Um, I would say, um, you know, in the San Inez Valley, uh, El Rancho and uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Noel Neal's, I've been uh, um, fresh. Fresh, uh, California Fresh Market? Yeah, yeah California Fresh. Th those are good places in this area. And then if you're from other areas in California, one of our real go-tos is Whole Foods. Mm. Uh, they've been big fans of ours for a long time. We're not big enough to be in the big you know, distribution uh, outlets, uh, but uh, usually we can find our wines in the uh, smaller high-end retailers. Uh, but again, we sell so much of our wine direct. Uh, some of the, reta uh, the retailers you know, might get a case or two of the wines, uh, which is unfortunate, uh, but it's better to be that way than you know, more. Yeah. I would recommend uh, go online, buy a bunch of delicious and wonderful couple mixed cases of Ken Brown, drive into Buellton, drive through when they're open, get your wine, go out to industrial eats, have a great meal, make sure that wine stays cool in your car. And you will be not only thrilled uh, what Buellton can uh, provide, it is sort of the uh, center of Santa Barbara County wine firmament. So a uh, wonderful thing. Oh, Wes, and, uh, I'm ready to write it down. You were going to give us your credit card number, right? Yes, it, is. it starts with 5709 and ends with uh, 6309 or something. I, I don't know, but whatever you want to do, it's obviously um, support Santa Barbara wine. Obviously, thanks so much to Ken. Um, if you uh, aren't familiar with his wines, you owe it to yourself to understand uh, the potentiality of quality within Santa Barbara County. And I want to thank you again, um, Ken, not only for teaching me uh, to be a better viticulturist and a better winemaker, but um, basically to uh, be honest and forthright in everything I do in the industry. So thank you for the university. Again, it's been a pleasure to work with you, your family. Uh, one, of, one of my all-time favorite times in life. So. Thank you. And I, I'm sorry I spilled those grapes on that road up to Byron that time. Um, <laughs> That was the worst I moment. I was not going to bring that up, Wes. <laughs> that was the equivalent of a kid almost getting stabbed in my high school classroom. That was awful. But um, thank you for sticking with me. So I appreciate it. You got That's it. Right. Okay. Awesome, guys. Stay, cool. stay safe, be well, and drink good pinots. All drink right. Great, you know, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, put them in the comments in the notes, and I'll make sure I get you guys some answers. 
Other than that, have a great weekend. Uh, all my love to Deb, all my love to everybody else. Please um, um, be careful with yourself, wear a mask, and thank you so much again for all you've done for Santa Barbara Wine and California Wine as well. Okay. Thank you, guys. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it, guys. Thanks again. We'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, cool. Take care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave. Yeah, me too. I'll be in touch.